a small district cooling network started in one corner of Paris and slowly, slowly expanded. So now it covers the whole city. And that's how I think it would, would happen in India's cities as well. Hello, and welcome to the season two of Understanding the Future. I'm your host, Punit Gandhi, and Climate Center for Cities is excited to bring to you a podcast about the future of work in the field of climate change, urban development, sustainability, and innovation. We will talk to experts working on ground as well as in the top management of government and non-governmental organizations to better understand how the field looks like in future. This will help us in preparing to enable climate actions as well as gauge the type of skill sets and jobs that would be required in future to solve complex challenges. If you are listening to it for the first time, do tune into season one. Hello and welcome to the season two of Understanding the Future. I'm your host, Punit Gandhi, and today we have with us Benjamin Hickman. He's the advisor, Cities Unit, Energy and Climate Branch for the United Nations Environment Program. He will help us understand about district cooling in cities. Welcome to the show, Benjamin. Thank you. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. So let's start with understanding what is district cooling? Is it just a big AC we are talking about over here or was it what it? Yeah, it's a big AC. I mean, that's one way to put it. I think, you know, like we have different ways of describing it at UNEP. And what, I, what I'll do maybe is, is try to give you my, my favorite way is, I think, imagine what's, what you have coming into your home. Like you might have, you might have water, you might have gas, you might have electricity. And in many countries around the world, what they also have is either hot water or cold water coming in. And that's all it is at the essence is that rather than producing your own hot water or producing your own cooling, instead it's piped into your building from a central location. And what we have is in many cities, they'll have an underground network of pipes with hot water or cold water. Um, insulated pipes and those connect into your building in the basement and that replaces your air conditioning system or it replaces you know in colder play in colder climates it will replace your rate your um, electric heaters or heat pumps and why why do we do that I guess is it's got a long history district heating is over 100 years old um, and actually there's evidence the Romans even did district heating back over thousands of years ago, um, it's basically a more efficient way of, of providing heating and cooling to a building. Um, and obviously for India, we're much more interested in cooling, although we do, we do look at district heating in some of the colder parts. Um, it's, mu- it's far more efficient for uh, a building to be supplied with hot water or cold water than for it to produce it itself. And that is just well established in in many parts many many countries many cities that's well established there are some caveats to that but in general that's that's the case so we produce hot water cold water centrally pipe it to buildings and that replaces your air conditioner that's the essence of it um that, that sounds somewhere simple enough, but I think we will get into the technicalities of it. At yeah, yeah, of course. Stage. Uh, but so does this change again geographically, uh, this hot water and cold water systems, or do they remain yeah. somewhere similar across continents? But yeah, somewhere it would be heating, somewhere it would be cooling. Yeah, it, it does change. Um I mean, the, the essence of the idea doesn't change. And, and one thing I'd like to add is that often, often when we talk about district cooling uh, and we're piping cold water into your building, it's also a service model, just like, you know, um, uh, you pay for electricity, you pay for water, you pay for gas, you also pay for cooling. So a part of the district, when we talk about district cooling, it's obviously the technology but it's also, it's a business um, model selling you cooling. And that's quite an important distinction, which I can come to. And what we see in different geographies, uh, there's a lot of diversity, often based on the climate. So if we look into, say, Northern Europe, uh, we have district cooling systems. Some of the biggest in the world are in Europe. 
but they're often linked with district heating systems that already exist. And it will take, if there's too much heat in the district heating system, you might use that to produce cooling with something called an absorption chiller. And we also see that in Japan and in Korea and in China. Uh, so we see these hybrid systems which provide heating and cooling. There's a, there's a lot of opportunities for uh, capturing waste heat in those markets. And also because the climate is slightly colder, a lot of them are also you know, using seawater that is very cold and using that to provide cooling into the district cooling system. So one example in Copenhagen, which is quite a cold city, I've been there, they can take the fresh, freshness, coolness from the sea and use that to provide air conditioning to buildings. That's because the sea is quite cold. <laughs> so yeah, we have those sort of systems. We also have um, systems such as in Malaysia, uh, where we have, there's a system called Cyberjaya, which is just running simply off uh, electric chillers, producing cold water, storing it, and then pumping it around to different buildings. That model is also quite common in the Middle East um, and quite a few projects like that in North America. So yeah, it, you, do get a, you do get a geographical diversity, but the basic essence of providing cold water to a building rather than it producing it itself is the same. Whereas yeah, the technology to produce that cold water can change geographically. Yeah. And that's interesting. And so what is what is the size variation that we are looking at? What can be the smallest size and what can be the largest size in this kind of a system then? Yeah. So we actually, I think this has sort of changed historically, let's say. I think there's a lot of emphasis on larger systems previously in district cooling. Um, you know, some of the largest systems in the world, such as in Dubai, huge, huge pipes over one meter in diameter, pumping chilled water through the city. But I think as, as, the, as the concept has matured and it goes also into new markets where it's a very new concept, we're seeing very small systems which might just be connecting up, you know, two, three buildings together. And um, why connect two, three buildings? Well, it means instead of each building having their own chiller, their own cooling tower on the roof, they can just share a system. And by sharing that system, it's more cost effective. You actually need less chillers if you're sharing because there's different people, are, different buildings are using cooling at different times. So yeah, we, just to say we have very small projects all the way up to very large projects. Um, and it shouldn't be, it's, it's, it's good to find the middle ground, but it shouldn't be an impediment if you have just you know two, three buildings which need cooling. To consider this solution okay uh and in that case what what is the case for india like as of now what are we seeing the development in this sector for the yeah. indian context is it more towards the south or coastal areas or more towards the central region where there is much more heat uh which is again much more drier heat than other parts yeah, yeah so i think i mean first to say i think most of india geographically except some of the sort of the north north northwest and when i say north i'm talking into Uttarakhand and these kind of places they don't necessarily need district cooling because they don't necessarily need air conditioning full stop but um whether it's a humid coastal place or a dry area like nagpur these can all have district cooling installed because they all they all need air conditioning in some form and what we promote from from unep side is district cooling in combination with measures like building efficiency, passive cooling. So all of these things should be taken together um, because air conditioning should be the last resort. Obviously, if you can have a fan on, keep a fan on, but eventually if it gets too hot, obviously air conditioning it, it is, it is no longer a luxury in some of those places. And in terms of projects in India, we're seeing a slow momentum building with more and more projects coming up. And, what I, what I mentioned earlier about district cooling being a business model, this sort of becomes important here because there's actually a lot of projects in India where buildings are sharing cooling. You know, you look at Infosys campuses, a lot of airports. This is already being done on a technology level, which is great because that shows the technology works in India really well. 
what there are fewer projects of is where it's being sold as a service. So that would be a district cooling operator selling you every month cooling. And there, there's a li more limited number of projects. There's Gift City, which has been established in Gujarat, which I think is eventually planned to be 180,000 refrigeration tons, which is a big number in district cooling terms. Let's say that your typical air conditioner in your home might only be one, 1 1.5 tons. So, you know, we're talking over 100,000 of that. So it's a big, big project. Um, that's, in, that's slowly building out as well. Um, there's also a project just south of Delhi in Gurgaon called DLF Cyber City. Um, this is a 78,000 ton uh, district cooling system that produces electricity and cold water at the same time using a technology called tri-generation. And that's been going for over 10 years. And it's a very strong uh, showcase of the technology particularly. But there's also projects that have, there was one that was tendered in Andhra Pradesh, in Amaravati, the new capital. It's on hold right now, but that was a 20,000 ton project. There's projects being considered in Kerala, Tamil Nadu, uh, all over the country. We're also supporting one, an industrial district cooling project in Hyderabad. Um, they're shifting the pharmaceutical industry into a sort of township on the outside called Pharma City, and that's going to have all of the pharmaceutical industry provided with cooling through a district cooling network and also heating through a district heating network. So there's a lot all over India, I think projects are starting to come up. Cities are showing interest. There's a, yeah, like a groundswell, let's say, of, of, of projects now um, coming to the fore. Okay, that, that sounds quite, and yeah, it's across geographies, like north, south, east, west, everywhere. So you can see yeah. already some kind of uh, things already being implemented. So what when we're talking about this, what is the kind of efficiency improvement we are looking at compared to the normal re refrigeration or AC that we are yeah. using at home? Yeah. So this is always a difficult question for district cooling people to answer. And I'll explain why. When we are, so a typical building, say if you were in a shopping mall in Delhi, it's probably got underneath it something called a water cooled chiller. And that is using um, water on the roof through a cooling tower to keep the building cool. Um, so, compared to that system, like the best in class shopping mall system, it's probably can save, district cooling can probably save 20 25% of the energy used. Um, it can also save on cost, and also there are benefits around refrigerants. But when we look at systems that are using air, con air, air cooled chillers or you know, even buildings that are just covered in AC units and you can see those all up the, side, the facade of the building, there we can start to see, see efficiency gains of up to 50% because really um, it's just it, cooling each individual build, each individual room on a building with its own air conditioner. There is a lot of inefficiencies around that. And also the district cooling you know, when you go from a, when you, you must know it, when you go from a building, which is each room has got its own air conditioner to one that's centrally cooled, which is what's needed for district cooling, you actually have a better service. So you have ducting, which is also, you know, cleaning the air in the building is able to better stabilize the temperature. So actually it's, it's actually providing a better cooling service anyway. And then on top of that, um, we, can set, we can save energy by providing it centrally and piping it to the building um yeah yeah okay okay so it means yeah again I'm, I'm sure it's variable based on what exactly the system yeah. components are so that would be difficult but yeah that at least uh helps understand that okay this is quite significant when we are talking about 25 to 50 percent of efficiency gains in any respect exactly. that's yeah when you think at, when you think at how much you know in some states power can cost right like yeah. In Maharashtra, you know, power prices are really high. So if you can save 50% of your power purchasing, obviously you have a bit more upfront cost with the piping, yeah. but really over the long term, you should be seeing like big benefits um, economically. And that's the argument, which, you know, it's not just from UNEP side or from government sides. It's a lot of private sector starting to wake up to that because it's, it helps their balance sheet ultimately. 
yeah absolutely but so here then one of the challenges that i do see is that uh, we already have a lot of built up area we already have a lot of buildings a lot of uh, industries in place can yeah. it be brought into existing infrastructure projects or uh, is it difficult because in india particularly you don't have these two piping structures uh, one for hot and one for cold so yeah, how yeah. can that function out yeah so just to, just to clarify i think majority in india you don't need to have a hot water pipe running under the road i think the level of hot water demand in buildings is probably not high enough for most cities but definitely we would be promoting the cooling pipes for the district cooling and i think it's it is certainly possible to do it in existing areas there are reasons it's more difficult but there's actually reasons it's also easier um and i'll try to be brief but the when you imagine you have a greenfield area so you know a whole new township being developed and you know it's a flat barren piece of land you have to sell those you have to sell those plots of land and then you have to wait for the buildings to come and you have to wait for people to buy the buildings and start using cooling and all of that adds a lot of uncertainty and meanwhile you're trying to plan out your district cooling project so trying to match the real estate time scale to your district cooling project can be difficult but obviously when you go to a brownfield area you know and we we worked on a project in Pane which was a brownfield area of, of a couple of shopping malls some offices a hospital you already know exactly what those buildings are using you know exactly their cooling needs and you know they're going to keep using it year after year so you can design your system more exactly and as soon as it's installed you know the customers will be paying so on that level it's quite advantageous and a lot of companies like in malaysia are looking at these brownfield projects as a way to de-risk overall but it's difficult as well because in india and other countries you don't necessarily know what's under the roads um there might be all sorts of um challenges digging up the road stopping traffic but there's a lot of solutions for that you know like they can install these pipes very quickly now and obviously you can do this ground penetrating radar which can tell you what's there so you no know not to dig so i think it's there is a lot of existing infrastructure in india i think our recommendation would be look at a couple of buildings or free buildings which are looking for this kind of service maybe they're changing their chillers in the next 3 4 years um or maybe they just want to go for a more sustainable option start with that and then slowly expand and one of the biggest district cooling systems in the world um is in paris france and this started exactly like you know paris was has been built it's been there for you know hundreds and hundreds of years a small district cooling network started in one corner of paris and slowly slowly expanded so now it covers the whole city and that's how i think it would would happen in india cities as well so it's so if i can understand that that makes it yeah. like a more modular system so that you Absolutely. can keep on increasing it yeah yeah okay. and that's that's the key best practice after you know this industry's been around for a while and i think most industry experts would say keeping it modular starting mm-hmm. small slowly expanding it really de-risks the project and you know make sure you have the customers that are going to be buying it and you know you can plug in you can put in different district cooling plants in the city they can all be connected together kind of like a spider web going out um yeah and that's that's what happened in paris they have, i think they have five or six different district cooling plants spread out over the city and they also capture the the cold water from the river and use it to keep okay. the buildings cool which is kind of interesting yeah yeah so that that absolutely makes it and yes if you can actually make a web of these things it does make sense that okay it will be much more efficient on a much larger scale put yeah. it this way but here then i think again this might be a stupid question but uh, can then because it's the same amount of cold water coming in everywhere how does temperature modulation happen in each build apartment or uh every place so like if my room requires only 26 degrees or and you mm, want 22 yeah. degrees in your room how does that differentiation happen yeah so well so what we have is obviously the the district cooling network will be providing you with 
to your building's doorstep, cold water at around five, six degrees Celsius, let's say. It changes in different geographies, but it's around that. What your building has in its basement would be a heat exchanger between your building's internal centralized cooling system and the district cooling system. So you might you know, be running your internal cooling system at around, the, as in the, the temperature of the water going around the building at maybe 15 degrees Celsius, let's say. Doesn't mean that's the temperature of the rooms. So that, that water is pumping around your building at then 15. And then inside your room, you'll have a fan coil or you'll have you know, ducting coming, blowing cold air into your room, depends how, how you're doing it. And that will set the temperature in your room at what you desire. So that's one of the key key reasons a lot of a lot of a lot of customers go for district cooling is you know just like electricity you can just flick the light on and off and you have cooling coming you can modulate the temperature as you want it and of course you know there's the environmental benefits as well but you know most people aren't thinking about that they just want cooling when they want cooling and a lot especially commercial customers um, so it's it's um it's very very able to modulate the temperature as you need yeah okay okay that that sounds quite uh, basic heat exchanger principles that we are using yeah. eventually and yeah. uh, okay. so in that case the service model part that you had said that we are actually selling cold water over here for this so how yeah. does that function out so if you're using less amount of water, if you're using higher temperatures, uh, you will lose yet less water and accordingly we will be built less, right? Something like that? Yeah, so, so the, way they, the way they typically work is they'll have a fixed charge. So even if you don't consume any cold water, you'll have a fixed charge, which can be, you know, for some people, a bit controversial to get their heads around, but normally it's accepted as standard, just like, a, electricity you have a fixed charge for electricity right even if you're not using it and then per per refrigeration ton hour they say but basically per unit of energy that you consume from the cooling system you'll build on that and there's a set tariff and there'll be a you'll have a cooling service agreement which basically is setting out the um the tariff and and how that will change over time so you have a lot of transparency over what you're going to pay and often almost universally these are provided with much better metering than you currently have on your cooling system so you really will know exactly how much you're using and yeah obviously you know if you're if you're using 20 percent less in one month and then you know 40 percent more that's just re reflected in the monthly bill um just like for power just like for gas um and more and more just like for water as well obviously water metering is yeah. not everywhere but yeah Okay, so that's that's quite straightforward in that way. Uh, so, what is the if we, if we now have to go to the technical side of execution? What is the broad process of developing this for any you know district or any community? What all things are we looking at uh, to be at least be taken into account while developing any of the system? Yeah, so I think one thing that's definitely true is. Very, very early, and I think this process will be a bit different if it's a city or a real estate developer, but I'll try and speak generally for both of them. I think very early on, if you have a sustainability criteria for the area or you know a strategy that you want to be a more sustainable development, maybe you want to get a IGBC code for the area or something like that, I think it's really great to set out early on that you you want to have an efficient efficient cooling. And so, because cooling is probably going to be 50% of your building's energy need. So you, early on, you, you have that target or strategy around cooling. And then I think there are consultancies or even within UNEP, we have capacity to give a simple uh, look at the project and say, does this project make sense for district cooling? Or maybe it's only one part of the project which will make sense. You know, district cooling isn't going to be able to uh, work in areas which aren't very dense um, or if there's, uh, you know, if it's just a social housing development, it's possible, but it would be it would be a more difficult project than if it was a mixed use area. Um, so I think that first upfront look 
from a district cooling expert to be able to say whether it makes sense or not is a key step. And here I'd give a word of caution. A lot of real estate companies or even cities have HVAC advisors who aren't necessarily attuned or well-versed in district cooling, or maybe might be disincentivized to recommend district cooling. Um, so I think it's good to get a neutral opinion there um, from just an engineer who understands it. And then from there, what we would do is typically do a master planning of the area where we would look at where the buildings are coming up, the kind of timing of the buildings, what sort of cooling demand they have, different hourly demands. And from there, develop a kind of pre-feasibility study um, for a district cooling system. And that would really take down, you know, what's the network layout approximately, what kind of sources of cooling should we use? Should we use electric chillers? Should we use tri-generation? Are there any renewables we can use? Um, and then from there, we typically take the project through a feasibility assessment, and um, which a detailed project report can be developed off the back of. And then, you know, depending if it's a city, they could then go through a tendering process um, for, you know, bringing in private capital into the project, or maybe they want to develop it themselves. It's up to them. Uh, so they might just tender it for an EPC contractor. Um, and then once that, that, that uh, tender is done and the project is ready to be constructed, then it just goes into a normal um, project construction. And what it will be trying to do if it's a greenfield area is trying to match the development of the real estate. And there's always delays in real estate. You know, a green flagship township might say we're going to be 100% capacity in the next four years. 15 years later, half the buildings are still empty. And so the district cooling operator is taking a risk there, but they'll be trying to develop it in a way which matches that um, as much as possible. And that's why it's also important to have expert district cooling companies at least advising or if you know investing in the project alongside a city or alongside a real estate developer. Because they've most of them have faced those issues over the last 20 years and really understand how to mitigate those risks. Um, but yeah, so that's that's the general process. And one other thing I think which is really critical cities can do, um, as well as launching that project, is also look at the policies they can use to de-risk the whole project. So uh, a lot of examples globally of cities using their planning power to require buildings to connect to the district cooling system. And what that does is de-risks the whole project because we know the building is going to connect. Um, but also, you know, is, is a way for the city to, you know, ensure buildings are, are, are meeting higher sustainability standards. And their role there would also be convincing the real estate developers that what they're putting in makes sense for them. And other things like cities can give land or their land can be used for district cooling plants and they can get an equity share in the project. They obviously can give rights of way for the pipes to go under the roads. And they can also work to bring different renewable technologies they might they might be already working on. So if they're developing solar, they can look for models where they can provide low cost power to the district cooling system. So lo lots of ways cities can support. Um, but yeah, that, that's the general process. Um, yeah. yeah, and uh, so uh, this, this sounds quite interesting because then it's quite because it's a hundred year old technology let's put it yeah. the process is quite evolved already the exactly yeah and uh, so so what are, so with renewable energy is geothermal also a possibility over here that you can use it and definitely yeah so um there's different types of geothermal as you know so um we have very hot geothermal um and there we can use something called an absorption chiller which will basically take the heat, turn it into cooling. So in Paris, for example, there's a geo, geothermal um, project which produces heating and cooling. But you also have um, something called geo-exchange, which is using the fact that underground is actually often cooler than mm -hmm. above ground. Um, and there we can capture that difference using a heat pump um, and actually you know, provide buildings with, with cold water that way. So diff different ways, uh, geothermal, we definitely count. Another one uh, we see a lot of is capturing waste heat from say power plants or industries and using that to drive absorption chillers rather than just let it you know, dissipate into the air. 
Um, that's a really key renewable technology for for um, for uh, district cooling. And also, you know, if you've got a sea or lake or river nearby, depending on the temperature, we can use it um, either to produce the cold water needed, or at least to help us in the cooling towers to um, to, to to use part of that cooling energy in the cooling towers. Um, so many different renewables, solar thermal as well is one that has been used, uh, taking the waste heat from waste incinerators rather than letting that go into the atmosphere. I know there's a lot of waste incinerated projects in India. Obviously, they're quite far from developed areas often, but you know, if the district cooling system is large enough, you could justify a pipe going from a waste incinerator, waste incinerator 10 kilometers away because you're getting free energy for your district cooling system. So you could cool down a whole city neighborhood just from the waste that it's produced and it's already burning, you know, 10, 15 kilometers distant. Those, those big distances are feasible to do it uh, of 10, yeah, 20 yeah. kilometers. Yeah, yeah. Okay. There's, there's, there's district heating projects where they pipe heat for over 40 kilometers. Wow. So it's all possible, but, you know, it's, it's building, it's having that solid district cooling system there, which you know is going to use it to justify yeah. the investment in the pipeline. And those things don't always line up, you know, and, yeah. but going forward, they should, and, you know, India is, you know, I, I read that, you know, you're going to have three times as much commercial floor area in 20 years. Yeah. Like you have so much potential for this kind of, um, this kind of system, but it just really needs that for, for, forethought and planning to really yeah. say, okay, this city is going to be using huge amounts of cooling for the next hundred years. Let's think now how we're going to do that rather than let it just happen. And then suddenly, you know, electricity spikes and, you know, brownouts are happening or blackouts across the city. So it's the four, four, it's the planning, which really district cooling needs. And that is something a lot of cities struggle with globally. And I think it's not, it's not just India. It's not just the global South in the North, in where I'm from the UK, district heating hasn't taken off. Uh, like other countries developed it, uh, it's taking off now. But I think a big part of that is the forethought on energy planning, um, which is really, really crucial. So we're, we're, we're keen to support cities in India on that kind of uh, forward thinking. How are you going to cool your city over the next 50 years? How are you going to, how are you going to power it? Um, these are the big questions that lead to those kind of big projects. Um, Absolutely. Absolutely. That's true. And I think those questions are very important at this point and junction as well. So while you're developing renewable energy resources, you also are developing more efficient ways to do it, every other thing possible. Yeah. Uh, so what are what are the different challenges that you have found in executing such projects in India as of now? I think one one key challenge, and so we started working in India. Um, in 2015, I think. And I think one key challenge at the beginning was just people not really knowing about the technology. It was definitely very like, you'd walk into a room talking about something which, you know, no one in the room had maybe heard of or like very few technical people had, but a lot of policymakers hadn't, hadn't really caught on. Or they thought it was just something, you know, from very developed countries like, you know, the Middle East, Singapore, but, it's so breaking, building that knowledge and understanding, breaking some of those myths, you know, there's district cooling projects in many, many different countries like Colombia, Malaysia, Thailand, China, all over the world, there's district cooling projects coming up. It's not just Dubai, <laughs> you know, which is, you know, a, it's a different kind of development to a lot of Indian cities. So breaking that myth was the big one. I think the pace of real estate in India is quite challenging. I was speaking to one developer around Mumbai who was saying they'll think of a building and then two years later it's built. And these are like huge, huge, huge office towns. Whereas that process in Europe, say, would be like five to 10 years. So that amount of time to, to plan exactly what kind of energy infrastructure you want is, is useful. But that shouldn't be an issue as long as the real estate developer says, this is my timeline for these buildings. And at the same time, I'm, as all the other infrastructure, I'm also going to put cooling pipes under the road. So it, it shouldn't be an issue. Um, the, I think another key one is city capacity. You know, 
um, a lot of district cooling projects are you know are best are best developed when the city is really involved and is able to help in the planning is able to help promote them convince stakeholders and india cities obviously everyone knows have a capacity challenge you know they've got services such as sanitation public transport all of these things that they're trying to improve at the same time and you add on cooling obviously they really care about their citizens and thermal comfort etc but they're probably going to be saying and I, this happened to us why should i care about how a shopping mall is cooling <laughs> like when i've got social housing projects i'm trying to develop here which you know it's like and it, it's true like it's it's a capacity challenge and obviously cities in more developed countries have got more funds to spend on this kind of project that's why we're trying to promote models where the district cooling system can actually reimburse kind of the the city's expenditure of capacity of having officials engaged so a lot of projects might have a concession area where they're allowed to operate but every year could pay a concession fee to the city just to help you know keep this so the city has some benefit and the city can use that on something completely different or it could invest it into you know cool roofs in a slum area or you know uh, you know less developed area of the city it could use it on many different projects and that's i think something we'd be promoting in india quite hard um, so kind of reimbursing the city's time i think other challenges is a lot of district cooling developed in countries like northern europe also so uh, japan korea readily available supply of gas wasn't so controversial to use gas so they have gas cogeneration tri generation a lot of systems developed off the back of that um india doesn't have a huge experience of tri generation it doesn't have those established gas network and of course now gas is a bit more questionable as a fuel as we look forward to trying to decarbonize the energy system but you know as many challenges many positives and i think the balance of it is the positives do outweigh i think almost every city in india should be looking to start at least an initial small project and probably has got some private private especially the big metros will have a lot of private real estate that's already doing it but just not calling it district cooling they're just saying well we've got four buildings and we just call them from the same place <laughs> no one's called it district cooling but okay so i think it's 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 definitely uh, it's definitely on the way up um but really um, when india published their cooling action plan first country in the world i think one key thing from it was district cooling was there which for, for a start we were extremely happy about because it shows the importance it's also saying in the longer term district cooling can significantly displace air conditioning and i think that is that's the point is that this is a long term vision and so to get to that long term vision cities can start with three four buildings and then you know test it how does it work does it make money is it something we can slowly expand it's not asking cities okay you need to develop your whole district cooling across your whole city because it doesn't work like that it's a 20 30 year project of slowly expanding um, so that's that and that's how you overcome those challenges basically it starts small and grow out absolutely you know that, that it's it's important and i think that is where the modularity of the system will be helpful because unless and until you can experiment valid validate it for the local conditions and yeah. people have trust in it i don't think so taking up a huge project would be advisable otherwise it might not lead to the returns that we were expecting i think i mean big projects they do make good returns it's not that Absolutely. it's more yeah. it's you know it it's hugely variable so for example this hyderabad city farmer city project we're working on you know that's going to be one of the biggest district cooling projects in asia if it's developed that is a large project which is going to be economically viable but you know a small a small project in a city uh, especially a tier 2 city pre four buildings if you can have more great but you know don't be don't be put off because that's all you've got right now or you know and it will slowly expand so even rajkot where we're supporting district cooling into their smart city plan and all of this the key recommendation is don't put all of the pipe infrastructure down right now let's wait to see what buildings come you know the building class might even change from commercial to residential or who knows so start in a corner of it work out uh, spread out 
that would be the key, key recommendation. Um, and, and I hope, I really hope cities in India pick it up. Um, yeah. That would be amazing. Absolutely true. That's true. And so what what is the percentage range of price variation we would look at in comparison to the normal cooling over here? Yeah, so it's the, the thing is, no, I, I'll start slightly back on your question. No one really knows how much they're paying for cooling. Like, how much do you pay for yeah, cooling? Enough. Like, okay, uh, so no one knows that. No one knows the answer to that. You might have a rough idea because you're like, maybe it's half my electricity. But then, you know, yeah, how much are you paying? How much are you paying on the maintenance of your AC? How much did you pay for the AC? Are you saving up to buy the replacement for the AC? And so all of these factors make saying, what is your cost of cooling? A bit challenging, but obviously we can yeah. do it. We can work it out. And what we find is with district cooling, the projects we've assessed in India anyway, is we should be able to give a sort of 10 to 20% discount on what companies are already paying or buildings are already paying. But there's also vast complexities with that. Different buildings pay different electricity prices, for example. Uh, residential compared to commercial tariffs is hugely different. The district cooling system might try to, you know, subsidize the residential to, to make sure the residential customers connect compared to the commercial. But generally, we should be able to get 10 to 20% at least, I think, in a well-designed project once you take all of that into account. And that's, I think, when a district cooling operator goes up to a building they might ask you, know, what are you paying for cooling? And then they'll they'll help them calculate, you know, how much did you pay on this tick, on these, on your maintenance team over the last five years? How much did you spend on refrigerants? How much did you spend on? And when you add it up, I think uh, people will also be surprised actually um, how much did you spend on it? Yeah, because um, here one of the one of the major things I see as different is that my capex is gone technically if I'm putting a new yeah. system. Uh, in comparison to that, my capex has gone. Uh, it's just the opex. So opex might be a bit higher than uh, the normal opex, but somewhere over the years it might be a bit lower. Is that true? Yeah. It depends. So sometimes what you have is something called connection charge, where to yeah. connect to the district cooling system, they'll make you pay an upfront lump sum, which could is basically like capex, and you also have to pay for your you know the internal piping in your in your um, building, the heat exchanger, different projects. It might be on you to pay for the heat exchanger. So there's some upfront capex, um, but yeah, it's like um, it is like a, a service model. You know, you don't have to when you connect to the electricity system, you don't have to pay for the whole electricity system of the city. Yeah. You're paying for like the fact that 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 system has already been capitalized over several years, and you know, but you are paying to connect. But, you know, it's not like you have to pay for the whole thing. So I think definitely customers like it because obviously they can save money up front. They don't have to put, you know, three whopping great chillers in their basement. They don't have to put cooling towers on their roof. They also can use the basement for something else like car parking and the roof for something else like a garden or, you know, these things. And yeah, they can they, they connect and they, they can see exactly the return, uh, the, the cost saving. For the district cooling operator, it's just like any high capex, uh, low opex model. So they say so. Just like it's not exactly like renewable power, but it's similar. You're putting a lot of money up front because you know the savings are coming down the road yeah. from a lower opex, right? And that's 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 where a lot of project financing would 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 uh, be be different, I think, compared to somebody replacing their air conditioner every, you know, yeah. well. Six years, if, if you want to keep on top of the efficiency, more like 10, 15 years, if you know, yeah. you're know you not. True, true. So I, I'd like to come down to our last question that is on skill sets, because we have been talking about this. We have talked quite in depth. And I would like to now understand that uh, because we are trying to understand what's the future of work over here. If you want yeah. to bring district cooling to India, what all different kinds of skill sets we would require? And at a large scale, if you want to bring it in, what are the different skill sets that would be required to be able to bring this to action? I think the first thing to say is a lot of skill sets already exist in India for this. So there's large shopping malls already installing centralized cooling systems. Um, you know, 
there's expertise in in digging up roads, putting pipes in. I think there's some specific skill sets around district pooling, around the planning side, um, making sure that you know, well, urban planners understand it, and that's just the capacity building exercise that you have. Um, consultancy companies um, able to help actually plan out and design the network. I think that skill set needs to be built up, and so. For now, I think it's good to have a hybrid of consult international and local consultancies working on projects. Same on the legal side, same on the same on the financing side. In terms of actually delivery, I think there's some specifics around welding um, and actually welding pipes together. But these are like very easy barriers to overcome. Um, I, I think generally it's not it's not going to be an issue. I think. It's something which will just slowly transition into, into Indian companies. So we're already seeing Indian companies interested in building up their own district cooling capacity. They might be bringing some international experts in right now and, you know, bringing them to, to transfer that knowledge. But a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of countries are in the same boat, building that up um, slowly, bringing international experts in to establish the industry domestically. Um, so, yeah. I don't, I don't see it as a big big barrier, to be honest. Okay, thank you so much. If This was quite interesting conversation. Uh, if I've missed out on anything and you would like to cover it up, I think uh, we can do it right now. There's just one other one, which I think is interesting, because, you know, a lot of cities in India are also very water stressed. And I know this is a big issue, especially cities like Chennai. There was just one other thing I wanted to mention is I know a lot of cities in India are really water stressed, especially cities like Chennai is that with district cooling one of the, one of the reasons that it's developed and it's this is one of the reasons it really did well in the middle east as well i think is it doesn't need to use potable water for air conditioning so a lot of water cooled chillers like i mentioned earlier they're using drinking water to basically cool down a building which doesn't make any sense if drinking water is an issue in the city so what we can use is something called treated sewage effluent which is basically water that's been treated but you know, not to the same standard as drinking water, and use that in cooling towers. And that's much more easy to do in a centralized location than trying to do that in each individual building. So that's another key benefit, I think, especially cities in water stressed areas can think about um, as a reason to go for it. So here, just to follow up question over here. So this is a closed water system, and how much of water replenishment we would require to do this thing? Uh, so yeah, so it's it's you have, you have the, the district cooling pipe under mm. the ground. That's a closed water system. Yeah. So the water being pumped to the buildings, you know, there's a heat exchanger, it go, there's a yeah. return pipe bringing the water back. That's the closed system. But then in the district cooling plant, just like on a normal shopping okay. mall, you have cooling towers which are running. And those cooling mm. towers are often using water to, to cool an electric chiller in, in the district cooling plant or, or a tri-generation system. And that's where water gets used. And so what I'm saying is for district cooling, that water we use there doesn't have to be drinking water. And I think that's a huge benefit. And it's a way of forcing air conditioning away from, well, centralized air conditioning away from using um, that water, uh, drinking water. Yeah. yeah. Okay, this this was a very interesting uh, conversation. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, it was surely a pleasure talking to you and understand this in nice technical and financial depth of uh, this is actually possible in India as well at a very good extent. Thank you so much, Benjamin. Yeah, thank you so much, Punit. Really great talking to you. You have been listening to Understanding the Future podcast. To know more about Climate Center for Cities, check out our website www.niua.org slash c q. The show is conceptualized, produced and edited by Punit Gandhi, Senior Associate at CQ. You can now subscribe to our podcast on your favorite channel, which can be accessed through the credits. Also, don't forget to follow us on our social media for more updates. Do share your reviews with us and help us spread the podcast to your friends and colleagues. Do write to us if you would be interested in learning about any specific topics. Thank you and stay tuned for our next episode.